so I'm excited to uh, see such a great audience. <coughs> Sorry. So level one is actually one of the most advanced uh, technical course offered in MLD. Uh, it was designed originally for a very small audience. This is the 15th year anniversary of the class. And we began by just having about 10 students in a class 15 years ago. And uh, this year we have, uh, I believe, uh, 160 registered and another 50 also on the waiting list. So I couldn't imagine 10 or 15 years ago this class become uh, almost like an elementary intra class. Uh, but uh, I, I do want to remind you this is an advanced class. The technical materials has been deemed challenging in every year. And I personally got a lot of complaints every year uh, you know, about uh, the challenge and the, the difficulties, everything about the class. Uh, I don't have an intention to reduce the difficulty. <laughs> Just give you a warning. But on the other hand, I do intend to make you guys all learn a lot from this class and also to get great grades out of the class. Okay, there is no examination in the class, no midterm, no final. Hopefully that will make you a little bit uh, uh, less worried about uh, the stress. Uh, there will be a few homeworks. There will be a major uh, class project, which I hope to see a lot of good papers out of you. You know, many of the former students published their first paper in this class, and that actually become the uh, main incentive for many students to take this class. Okay, now we seem to have a full room. Uh, let's get the, the, the presentation started. This class is also recorded. Uh, so uh, I do encourage you to uh, you know, use that uh, resource to uh, uh, dive deeper into the material. And also we also uh, regularly post additional reading materials for those uh, students who want to do deeper investigations on certain topics. In a sense, you, know, you will find that every lecture could be blown into a semester-long class because this is a very, very big overarching lecture on everything in machine learning. So we really want to use this as almost like a, uh, a, uh, a guideline you know, for your own you know, self-guided study down the road, give you pointers and give you an update of the, of the state-of-the-art topics and also the foundations behind it. All right, so a little logistics. You should uh, regularly visit this homepage where materials, updates, uh, informations are, are, are posted. And uh, people often ask for a textbook. Uh, I was asked to uh, write a textbook for many years, but it's very, very challenging to write a textbook for this topic because it's evolving so fast. So just for uh, you know, uh, maybe some foundational preparation, I put two textbooks. One is officially published by Daphne Kohler and Neil Freeman. The other is uh, unofficial, but uh, widely available online from Michael Jordan. They give you the uh, statistical uh, theoretic foundation about graphic models and uh, a few, in fact, quite many classical use cases. I encourage you to uh, get those books uh, as your encyclopedia and on your shelf. Uh, but on your hand, uh, don't find, don't try to look for state-of-the-art solutions in those books because these are written uh, more than a decade ago. But they're still great books. We're going to post uh, papers, tutorials, and other modern materials online from the class homepage. And there is also a discussion forum uh, in Piazza where uh, you guys uh, should uh, feel free to uh, uh, ask questions and uh, uh, carry out uh, uh, class interactions and so forth. And uh, the homework will be submitted to Grayscope. I'm very fortunate to have uh, quite a few great TAs. Uh, whose names are listed in here. Uh, I believe most of them are here. Can you please stand up so that people know your face at least? All the TAs, Xun, Ben, Hao Han, Yiwen, Xiang, and uh, Junxian. I think we have at least four of them today in, in town. Great, thank you very much uh, for being the TA. It's uh, a quite uh, challenging task even for the TAs, in fact, uh, because uh, supervising your class projects and uh, designing and grading your homeworks will be their major undertaking, which is uh, quite uh, demanding. So uh, I really appreciate all your inputs. 
And also we have a class assistant, Amy, who is my EA. Uh, if you have a logistic questions like how to get registered and how to fill out an auditing form and all that, uh, you can go directly contact her. Uh, yeah, so as I said, auditing is permitted, but you need to fill out a form. Uh, and uh, uh, if you worry about whether you can clear a wait list, uh, I believe everyone will be cleared at the end of the day, but uh, you want to follow with Amy for the logistics. And here is uh, the requirements, as I just mentioned. Homework uh, comprises the bulk of the overall grade, 50%. And uh, in the homework, we'll be mixing both theoretical questions and uh, uh, applicational, implementational questions. And uh, most of the, 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 the problems will be helping you to uh, uh, grasp the basic materials. There will be some, maybe one or two additional questions which can be counted as bonus uh, that encourage you to dig digger, deeper into the advanced materials. And uh, we want to continue the tradition of uh, a scribe practice. Uh, every class, in every day, uh, two of the students in the class will be preparing uh, scribe notes to be shared by the entire class. You will find this extremely useful because uh, uh, all the equations will be typed and uh, all the presentations will be documented. You can also use the recording to uh, really polish the, the scribe notes so that at the end of the semester, we will have uh, literally a book you know, out of the class for everybody to share and for the community to share as well. By the way, this class is literally watched by the community all over the world, so I think uh, your contribution will be acknowledged over there as well. Uh, final projects, which is 40% uh, of the grade. Uh, here I wrote uh, some uh, suggestive uh, themes in those projects. Again, it could be a uh, implementational, algorithmic, application, or theoretical uh, you know, subjects. And uh, we strongly encourage uh, you guys to form a team as early as possible. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, without the exception, uh, we, 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 unless exceptional, exceptional things happen, we do expect you guys to form a team of three people. Uh, because imagine that uh, if uh, uh, out of the 160 students, each one has a solo project. Not only the project cannot be very big, but also we will be ending up with uh, 160 presentations at the end of the day, which is bigger than a conference. That will be impossible for us to even grade, right? So, yeah, do form a team right now uh, with uh, three or four members, and then uh, submit uh, your uh, team composition uh, as soon as early as possible to the TAs on the class website we do have uh, milestones and dates you know, for different stages of the, class of the project preparation. And for those of you who want to get an A+, plus, or who, for those of you who just uh, uh, missed uh, uh, certain uh, key points and want to bump up your grade, you can also take advantage of this bonus mechanism to get some additional uh, credits, which uh, involves uh, you know, your contribution of uh, the Piazza and other form of uh, participation in a class, such as showing up in this classroom. Uh, and also, in the uh, middle of the semester, we'll be doing a uh, survey to collect feedback so that we can adjust uh, the style and the contents for the rest of the semester. And uh, I cannot emphasize more how important the class project can be. I will get your question in a second. Um, this is really, you know, a... Uh, a uh, practice or an exercise meant for serious investigations. Don't blow up a homework. Say I grab a data set and I applied an algorithm downloaded from another art marketplace and call it a project. Okay. The project really meant, is meant to be an uh, you know, uh, investigation uh, which shows your own kind of understanding of the problem and the problem of your favorite to solve and uh, uh, the value of the solutions and so forth, and maybe even analysis and understanding of uh, either positive or negative outcome of your implementation and so forth. And as you can see, in the past, you know, uh, many you know, uh, great work was uh, produced uh, from these pro projects. You actually see famous names like Yuri uh, Laskovic and Andreas Cross, who are now leading figures in the field. Their earlier papers were also published in this class. And I imagine that from this year, we'll be seeing future leaders 
getting their first piece of work done. That's, uh, that's my hope. Yeah, by the way, you have a question out there? So what is the requirement of auditing? What, what is the requirement? Yeah. The, uh, the recommended requirements? Yeah, yeah. For auditing? For auditing. Yeah. Uh, I would say I don't really have a uh, strict requirements. Uh, you should be officially uh, you know, eligible for the auditing, which means that you are either a CMU student, maybe you, should, you can also be a PIT student. Uh, there is a form <clears throat> that you need to uh, fill out to get approval, for example, from your advisor and so forth. Uh, but, but yeah, you can ask Amy for the, for the specific information. Okay, so now let's uh, get started. Any other questions, logistic questions? Okay, so uh, why this class is uh, potentially interesting and uh, can be of uh, value to you? You know, nowadays, you know, more than so, uh, than 10, more than 10 years ago or 15 years ago when this class is, has started, right now we are in, you know, a uh, very, very uh, noisy and uh, active uh, uh, field of machine learning where you, know, you see every year you know, hundreds of uh, algorithms and uh, their variations published. It's very, very hard for people to navigate. So here, in fact, uh, this morning I heard uh, a prep talk from one of my students for his uh, uh, thesis, and uh, I found this slide very interesting, so I brought it right you know, 10 minutes ago you know, from, from, from that presentation. This is a kind of a, uh, a peep at the marketplace of algorithms. You, know, you, you see you know, you know, different uh, learning criteria such as maximum likelihood, uh, such as uh, reinforcement learning. There are different type of knowledge such as uh, you know, uh, you know, rules and the constraints. Uh, there are different uh, styles of the model like the generative models, adversarial models, and uh, all this. Right? And uh, it is uh, very, very uh, difficult for a non-expert, maybe even for difficult for an expert to navigate in such a big space. And uh, it's also very, difficult, very easy for people to just drop into a pinhole and uh, stuck you know, in the local minima of their investigation or keep producing incremental results, uh, maybe reinventing or repeating uh, some results elsewhere that you just happen not to, not, not happen to be uh, aware about. Right. Uh, part of the goal of this class is to try uh, come up with a unified theme uh, that at least put all this uh, you know, uh, big pile of uh, market uh, you know, algorithm and model instances into a more organized closet, if not you know, under a unified formula so that uh, people can start uh, at least learning the materials more easily, if not using them even more systematically. Right? So, this is the view that we want to uh, at least uh, aspire to at the end of the day, that we use uh, a single tree or a couple of trees to unify uh, the majority of the algorithmic instances now we are reading or maybe will be emerging in the next uh, few years so that uh, you can basically uh, have a better awareness of where you are in your own investigation, which branch you want to go after and uh, how to design your algorithm to be more uh, reusable or more generous you know, uh, over different uh, applications so that uh, your impact can, can be maximized. Okay, so let's see at the end of the semester in May, uh, are we getting somewhat close to this view versus uh, that view, okay? All right, so to make this happen, uh, we need to start something very basic. Let's uh, do a very, very little recap of uh, the basic probabilistic concepts because uh, a majority of the uh, machine learning algorithms, or at least the foundation of those algorithms, come from uh, a uh, statistical modeling purposes. Okay? Nowadays, there are many algorithms who are defined by an oracle, such as the GAN model, or such as uh, many of uh, the, uh, uh, the optimization-based models they may be purely designed you know, around an algorithmic oracle. But at the core of uh, the motivation uh, basis of those uh, oracles, there is a statistical formulation that tries to model the data in the first place. So let's see how do we use probabilistic models to model data. 
right? For example, here I have a data instance which happens to have eight features, okay? And uh, how to write down a probabilistic distribution of uh, a data instance with eight features? Let's start, in fact, it, let's call them binary features to make the case even simpler. I just want to do a very quick review, or recap about uh, the basics here. How do you model that? In the most uh, straightforward and, uh, and uh, generic cases. Yes? You could enumerate the combinations and then give the probability that it's in each combination. Yes, perfect. So uh, you basically need to create a table like this where you, you basically put x1, x2 all the way to x8 and plus a p here. And then you enumerate all the possible configurations, right? It could be 1, 1, 1, 1, or 1, 0, and so forth. And then you put a tiny probability in here. That's basically the basic way of uh, doing this uh, uh, modeling of a multivariate uh, data instance. And uh, why we care about multivariate data instances? Well, that's probably uh, the, uh, the majority of your experience with the real world. Say you have a picture that has a few thousand pixels, if not more. If you want to model a uh, sentence, you have a, a couple of words. Very rarely you are dealing with a, 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 a universe event. You toss a dice. That's, yeah, you do that. But that's not very, very often happening in your life. Right? So this is the foundation of our statistic modeling, but there are a lot of uh, shortcomings. I think uh, the one of the first shortcomings you probably already realize is what? Is that this uh, table has to have many, many, many rows, right? Because uh, the size of uh, the, the number of uh, combinations uh, for uh, the number of uh, you know, uh, dimensions is uh, exponential. Therefore, you can quickly explode and uh, blow up your computer in storing basically such a joint distribution. Then there are a number of other questions involving learning and inferences, which I don't want to spend time to dive into. You will see that again in later presentations, which is that you need to basically deal with this complexity, not only in designing this table, but also in filling the numbers in this table or computing any you know, uh, quantities out of it, which uh, you know, translates to learning and the inference practice. Learning, for example, is to learn the probability of uh, you know, each, you know, uh, you know, uh, combinations of uh, uh, events. That means that you need to really, really uh, count very often and many times. And also you need to have a very, very large data set so that every configuration has to be represented. Otherwise you don't see it. You cannot just simply put a zero there because you may see it in the future, right? Inference means that you need to, you know, maybe sum up some of the rows so that the probability of a particular event can be uh, cumulatively calculated, but again, that means a lot of computations. So, how we can you know do something better than just enumerating a table like this? Let's look at a real possible world, because uh, numbers or data instances, you know, to maybe a pure mathematician, they are literally just numbers. But to a practitioner who want to connect the real world, they actually are instances or events from real world. Let's look at, for example, this particular event or, uh, or maybe uh, a phenomenon. Okay? It's uh, a, a problem describing the state of uh, a, uh, uh, a cellular phenomenon. You can call it that way. Basically, it's a, uh, in the biology world, uh, they call it a, uh, a regulatory pathway or signal transduction pathway and so on and so forth, where you know, there are molecules you know, uh, on and off, you know, taking signals, cascading the signals, relaying that, and the trigger some events, say uh, you know, a gene gets turned on and off and so forth. Right? So for a mathematician to model that, we don't call them a English or a Latin name. We really call them, you know, uh, you know, we use a symbol and we index that. You are still having eight random variables. But uh, when you turn to a biologist, uh, he or she would give you some additional knowledge. For example, uh, that biologist could point to you that uh, the top two 
parameters or uh, uh, variables x1, x2 belongs to molecules at the surface of the cell. And uh, the middle three correspond to uh, you know, uh, you know uh, molecules in the cytosol inside the cell. And the bottom two correspond to molecules uh, in the inner compartment of the cell, which is called the nucleus. And uh, she may furthermore give you that kind of diagram, okay, which tells you which molecule triggers uh, uh, which downstream molecule and so forth. And uh, she would tell you that uh, it is impossible to imagine that uh, receptor A would directly work with a gene H because they never meet each other in their life cycle. Right? So that kind of knowledge was from a biologist. Now as a mathematician, would that be useful for you to improve your model or you just ignore that? Right? And that's actually the question you know, which stays at the core of uh, this lecture or uh, this uh, entire class. You know, how to combine you know, domain knowledge of various forms, such as this, you know, into a uh, mathematical framework so that uh, we can make the mathematical expression of the model uh, more informative, maybe simpler, maybe more actionable. Okay, so these are all the keywords. Interpretable, actionability, simplicity, right, and the computability. These are the outcome, you know, we computer scientists care most about. Other, you know, in addition to the mathematical soundness. So, in a word, this leads to our, uh, you know, uh, presentation of uh, the graphic model. You already see this is a graph, and uh, in this part we have the model, and the graph marries the model, becomes graphical models. One thing that we care about most is uh, the, the 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 intrinsic meaning of a graphic model in a rigorous sense. For example, what does it mean by rigorous sense? Uh, if two people see the same data set, and uh, if they use their criteria to define a graphic model and come up with two different models, then that's not very rigorous because uh, you, you lose kind of the, the single source of truth and you cannot really uh, translate or extrapolate knowledge. Right? So therefore, um, there should be some uh, rigorous effort and, uh, to define you know, every entity in the graphic model, which uh, of course, includes the edges and nodes and so forth. And uh, it is very important. And also, it can be easily uh, ambiguous if you are not careful about that. So just to give you one example, this is a real example, which was kind of uh, amusing, but uh, hopefully you get a message. So this is a graph, right? And uh, can people see it? Can you recognize what this graph is? It's the graph of uh, uh, figures uh, in Bible, okay? And uh, you see Jesus to be the biggest node, which is not surprising because uh, everybody in the Bible uh, probably knows Jesus. And uh, then there are uh, other disciples like Peter, like Matthew, and then other people. Okay, so why we arrive at this graph? Why not a different graph? That's something you can ask. Maybe you can guess how this graph was created. Do you actually want to make a guess? Frequency. What's that? Frequency of occurrences. But that doesn't give you the edge, right? It gives you the size of the node, maybe, because occurrences is about every single individual, right? Yeah. Frequency of occurrences in the same sentence. Okay. Yeah, uh, that, that, that's, a, that's a nice uh, direction to go. Indeed, you can always uh, count uh, occurrences of uh, a pair, you know, yeah, within a sentence. But why not uh, within a page or within a chapter, right? I believe this one was uh, counted by the co-occurrence frequency within a, a page. Okay, not a paragraph. Not. So, but uh, another person used the same material can draw a different graph just by you know, defining the, redefining the scope of that. Right? So there are ambiguities, in fact, even in this very definition of the edge. So it looks like very simple, you know, that the edge is defining relationship, but, uh, you know, underneath that, we need to, you know, really dive into what exactly amounts to relationship. So I want to open the lecture today by having some discussions on that topic, and then in the future lectures, we're going to go broader from there. So relationship between two random variables you know, can have uh, many uh, aspects of uh, interpretations. 
And here are a few, already quite many. For example, we can say there are, they are related if uh, X and Y are correlated. Correlation is a very, very strict statistical definition with an equation there. Or they are dependent, or they are independent, or they are conditionally related, or independent and dependent, and so forth. Or maybe you can go even further with a human touch, say, you know, X causes Y, or Y causes X, that kind of uh, information. We can all call them relationship. So how can we really quantitatively, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know determine the presence and absence of these uh, relationships? Right. I think uh, one way to go is that uh, we could uh, explore a possible uh, one-number summary as the measure of the strength of the relationship, right? So that's, uh, you know, uh, giving us at least uh, some way to uh, get more rigorous about the graphical model. So here are some measures. In fact, uh, you know, there are lots of measures, and here are some examples, which I'm going to uh, explain a bit more in a second to hopefully reveal their inadequacy or adequacy, you know, for the purpose we want, right? Pearson correlations, mutual information, and uh, HSIC, Herbert Schmidt independence criteria, partial correlation, and so forth. Um, uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, picking them is not actually an arbitrary task, but it's actually a, a very, very uh, interesting to see, you know, what's the difference by adopting different criteria. In the past, in the early days of uh, graphical models, uh, you will often see nature uh, papers in high-profile journals like Nature, where a researcher would just arbitrarily uh, pick up a measure and show you a graph, call them gene network or a social network and so forth, which are graphically always very appealing. You can always tell the story out of a graph, right? But uh, when dive down to the statistical definition, uh, sometimes uh, it is not very very rigorous. It's easily uh, defeatable by some counterexamples uh, on the same data and so forth. So now let's uh, look deeper into, you know, what all these uh, different definitions can give you. So probability one on one will already teach you Pearson correlation. It is one of the very basic uh, definition of a correlate, correlatedness. Uh, so it defines the linear dependencies between two random variables, and there are formulas defining that. But there are two important caveats I want to remember, One, which is that if X and Y are independent of each other, then you are guaranteed to see a zero Pearson correlation. But unfortunately, the reverse is not true. Okay, if your Pearson correlation becomes zero, it doesn't mean that your X and Y are necessarily independent. And I invite you to... Uh, think about a counterexample, and I'm going to take that question from there. You can, the rest can, can think about your examples about why this is uh, not true. Yeah, your question? The what? The ceiling lights. The ceiling lights, oh, okay. Let me try something, because I don't want to touch uh, Mm. But can I touch this? Uh, these are the screens, I believe. Okay, I didn't find buttons. This room has become very modern now. Everything is a remote controlled. Otherwise, I would just find a button and turn it off. But uh, let's see. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't find a, uh, a switch. So I will figure out next time, okay? So you can watch, hopefully, the, the, the recording, you know, if uh, you cannot see the whole thing. All right, anybody come up with a counterexample already? Oh, yeah, this may be better. Yes, please. Uh, uniform distribution on a 
Okay, uniform distribution on a. Uh, two dimension numbers. Okay. So the expectation of x given y is zero at any point, but we cannot call the distribution of x independent of y. Uh, I, I didn't see the clear definition of what is x and what is y. So if, if I just draw a circle, mm -hmm. radius 1, and I assume a uniform distribution over this, it's centered at 0. Mm -hmm. So the distribution of x independent of y is centered at 0. But the expectation of x given by is 0 at any point. Can you express x and y in terms of a, a function? Or x? Because if I throw a random, I throw a random die and a dart into this pie, I cannot say that x and y are dependent, right? But if I look at the distribution of x at a given y, it depends on that y because it cannot extend beyond a certain point. So if we take the probability uh, distribution as one by pi at any point, so it integrates to one, and I, so the distribution probability of x given y is dependent on the y. Mm, I'm not sure. You can. So, what entails us to claim that uh, x and y are independent? Well, it's uh, really about uh, if we can basically write this into. Right, that one basically will complete the definition of independences. I still don't get why they are not independent. It, it, it looks like a guess. But do you have a uh, expression? Uh, so if I, if I say y is equal to 0, the x can range from minus 1 to, or let's say minus 1 to 1. But if I say y equal to 1, the only value x can have is 1 at that mm, point. Mm, mm. I can see your, 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 your way of argument. Uh, maybe you, I encourage you to show it on paper. Uh, what I will show you is something even simpler, okay? I basically want to show you that I can still express uh, y as a function of x, which guarantees that they're dependent, right? And I can still show that their Pearson correlation is zero, okay? And I will give you just a hint that you guys can show you know, on, on, on your proof, maybe. How about uh, I put x to be a uh, uniformly distributed number in minus one and plus one in that space on a single line. And I define y to be x squared. So y is dependent on x for sure, right? And you can calculate the Pearson correlation and see what it is. So this is a form of what we call the nonlinear dependencies, which uh, very trickily defeated the Pearson correlation because Pearson correlation is really capturing linear dependencies. What you said, maybe, what may, I, th I think what you're trying to say is that maybe x is a cosine function or whatever of x. And, uh, but but you yeah, try to express that, and you, you, you can show it. Okay. Anyway, so the point is not about the example. It means that uh, the point is really Pearson correlation is uh, very weak in terms of uh, capturing independences. And therefore, you know, in the early days, many publications of uh, gene networks and the social networks based on correlation you know, are problematic because uh, even though a whole graph is show, the meaning of the edge is a very localist definition which only look at uh, a pair of random variables in isolation and only on their linear dependencies. Okay. And uh, so we need to have something a little bit stronger. At least you know, for a pair, we want to uh, strengthen them into independence rather than correlation, and independence in the sense of uh, nonlinear as well, not only just linear. Right? And as I said, you know, uh, statistically, to define two random variables to be independent, this factorization property is enough. In a sense, you just want to establish equivalence between two distributions. One is uh, the joint of two random variables, and the other is the product of two univariate variables. Okay? 
And how to establish equivalence? Well, you can measure distances between this and that. Okay? And if the distance is zero, then you have independence. Okay? So very, very straightforward reasoning. So what could be the uh, reasonable distance for measuring two distributions on the left and the right? Chaotic divergence. That's the, maybe the only most straightforward distance. Of course, we can go after distance and other, other divergence. And other, but this, these are special cases. Right? So KL could be used to measure distances. And uh, you know, in fact, uh, a, a, another uh, in the information theory, you know, there is a term called uh, mutual information, which is uh, the KL divergence between two special cases of the distribution. One is the joint, the other is uh, the factored, the product of the marginals. Okay. All right. So that's a score. Mutual information can properly measure the independence uh, between two random variables. Okay. So we have a new score. But this is easy to say, but uh, very difficult to compute. Okay. Because uh, you can see that uh, the actual calculation involves the integration over a uh, pretty complex density function. And uh, for Gaussian, it's no problem. For discrete, it's fine. But uh, in reality, if we have a fancier or maybe multimodal or maybe non-parametric distributions, computing this can be challenging. Right? So for that, in recent years, uh, there has been work uh, developed around uh, kernelizing or embedding distributions based on key sufficient statistics, such as mean, such as uh, higher order moments, that you can use a few numbers, which can be, well, why numbers are important? The reason they are called sufficient statistics is because uh, you can obtain those numbers purely from data. You don't have to know the analytic form of the distribution. Right? But uh, the magic is that uh, once you have those numbers, there is a way to mathematically embed the original distribution like this, which are very, very irregular, into a point in some uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, Hilbert space. And then you can comp uh, compute you know, a distance between the two points. And then you get uh, you know, a uh, information or independence criteria. Okay? So this work was uh, done, in fact, partially done here. Okay? You know, you know, Arthur Gretton was a postdoc here. And his co-authors was also who also worked here, including one of my postdocs, and they actually uh, uh, developed a pretty rich body of uh, this material. Uh, by the way, uh, you know, if I'm interested in this topic, you know, in, at the end of the semester, we actually left uh, three open spots for lectures elected or topics elected by you guys. So you can, you know, you know, cast your vote, you know, at the end of the day. Uh, telling me you know, which part to lecture, including this part. I could, uh, I'm glad to go deeper into this theory. Okay. So at the end of the day, you know, we can generalize the definition of uh, mutual information to HSIC and uh, to define independences. That's basically allowing you to compute uh, you know, more flexible distributional forms. Yes, question there? What uh, by reverse KL? Reverse KL is also fine. Uh, in fact, you can use any measure, but uh, uh, there are different uh, interpretations uh, because, uh, first of all, there is a computational issue. Reverse KL is not necessarily so easy to compute. Or sometimes it's easier to compute. But uh, whether uh, that one relates to some uh, well-funded likelihood score where you are going to use in the future to learn the global score of the model, that is not clear yet. Okay. There are reasons to use uh, this form of KL because uh, it connects very, very uh, nicely to some other loss measure we're going to use in the future to learn graphic models. Okay. But uh, in practice, yes, people do use reverse. Okay. You will see actually uh, at the end of the day, uh, we're going to go toward uh, the so-called Oracle programmed uh, models where the mathematical form becomes secondary and the, the execution becomes first primary. Then you basically just plug in all sorts of uh, uh, micros and uh, functions, and you compute it. You lose some kind of uh, mathematical beauty in terms of convergence and other you know, uh, probability, but you can still make it work. Okay, so, but uh, good question. We're, we're going to save it for later. Okay. All right. 
So uh, we have a few measures already. They are all pairwise. So are you now happy with uh, what we have? It looks like uh, we have now the definition of the nodes. We also have the definition of the edge. We are good. In a way, we can actually build a graphic model already. So maybe let's build one. Here I have uh, three random variables, just three. OK, very simple one. We have an x, which is uh, the height of uh, a kid. And uh, we also have uh, uh, maybe uh, y, which is the, the vocabulary of a kid. We also have a z, which is the age of a kid. How do you build graphic models? Well, at least for now, with the tools you already have, you could collect, you could, you could do a survey of 100 kids, for example. And then you can use uh, you know, uh, the survey outcome to compute well, either a Pearson correlation or mutual information or uh, HSIC uh, between every pair. Right? And uh, I bet you will be getting the following. Okay, you will be getting the following. Basically, every pair has some correlations or has some are are dependent and not independent. Maybe this is a better way to say it. Do you believe it? You better believe it or you can try it. Okay, in fact, uh, if you look at this word in isolation, you know, just look at uh, all two people, uh, just by looking at their numbers without any other evidence, chances are they are always dependent. Okay, you can always find a statistical dependencies between them just by chance or whatever. Um, well, that, that's, well, sometimes you may still find, but I guess most of the chances you will get some dependencies. Then what you get is this. So that, does this graphical model really uh, makes you happy? What's your kind of uh, human model that you would use to model such a phenomenon? Okay, that's a great piece of prior knowledge. You know, from our experience, we kind of reason that, uh, yo, I do, supposedly it's the age that causes the vocabulary and the heights and so forth, right? So you may be thinking about uh, something more like this. Right, okay, so yeah, I believe, I agree with you. This looks like a much better model, at least in terms of informativeness. Or nowadays we're talking about AI being explainable and so forth. This is explainable. Otherwise, if you give that graph to some people, they, they, you will probably lose your contract because they don't like to work with you. Right? It doesn't make any sense. Right. So, but our current tool doesn't give us this model. Right. Okay. So, maybe uh, let's uh, look a bit deeper. What's really happening is that uh, when we are computing the dependencies or correlations or mutual information, so on and so forth, we we'll only look at uh, you know, a uh, pair in a marginal sense. We ignored all the other information that is uh, coexisting in the domain. Now, there is one more score that comes to rescue, which is called the partial correlation, which basically uh, measuring the correlation between a pair given some evidence, okay? And uh, again, this uh, correlation is uh, capturing the linear dependency one, just like the Pearson correlation, where <clears throat> the definition is actually quite intuitive. It's really computing the Pearson correlation between the residues. Okay, the residues are from uh, the original random variable minus the linear effects from that common cause that you guessed. Okay, in fact, if you know the domain so well, you could uh, even guess what is the cause then Z is the cause, and you can build this. If you have no idea which one is the cause, then you need to try all three combinations together, and uh, at the end of the day, pick one. But again, at least uh, they are quantifiable. Okay? So that gives you the conditional Pearson correlation, or partial correlation, like this. And uh, of course, you know, uh, if you have uh, too many random variables, uh, more than three, uh, you will be computing this, uh, uh, maybe minus one. 
that seems to be quite uh, scary, right? So because uh, I need to condition on the linear effects of all the others, would, would that be very, very challenging? It is, right? If you don't have any uh, assumption or you have any limitations of those, then all these other things can cause all sorts of things. You know, uh, nonlinear combinations, log logical and so forth. But remember, this is a linearity. And the plus a assumption on Gauss signality is going to save your world. Right? You could actually uh, prove to yourself that if everything is just, every dimension is, uh, you know, uh, marginally a Gaussian, and the whole domain is multivariate Gaussian that can be captured by a uh, covariance matrix, then the impact of uh, all the other random variables on each of this one is just a linear regression type of form. It's just, uh, you, know, you know, combinations, additive linear effects, which can be actually captured by the coefficients in this uh, uh, so-called inverse covariance matrix. <coughs> Okay, I think, I think I'm already losing a few ones. Do you know what is an inverse covariance matrix? Do you know what is a covariance matrix? Right, you know what is. Covariance matrix being something that if you have a Gaussian distribution, multivariate Gaussian distribution, uh, it is, uh, you know, really defined by, you know, uh, a mean and also a uh, uh, covariance uh, matrix, right, as a parameter. And uh, the inverse Covariance is just uh, the inverse of the sigma. Okay, and uh, it turns out that you can compute the partial correlation just by adopting this formula, which is quite quite simple. So, in a sense, if everything is Gaussian, you are good. You actually could uh, compute uh, a pretty uh, straightforward uh, partial correlation graph. And likewise, if uh, you want to uh, compute uh, you know, uh, you know uh, the independence, then if everything is Gaussian, you actually could even establish a uh, equivalence between the partial correlation and also the mutual information. Okay. Okay. So now we have a pairwise, uh, you know, uh, uh, dependencies or relationships in the context of uh, all other random variables, at least in special cases. So that far, I want to make a stop so that we see where we are in terms of characterizing the relationship. So this single word relationship is already causing us so much to, uh, to, to navigate. So starting from the goal of measuring associations or relationships between two random variables, you can already adopt a marginal or a non-marginal, which assumes presence of other random variables. Then down the path of a marginal, you want to capture both linear and nonlinear. And uh, in the case of linear, you have the simplest the Pearson correlation. In the case of nonlinear, you have, uh, you know, uh, most generally, you know, the distance measure between two distributions, the joint or the product marginals. And then you can plug in KL or the max mean description, which is the Hubert Smith's information uh, independence criteria to compute uh, you know, uh, such distances for arbitrary distributional form using kernel embedding technique. And then KL is equivalent to mutual information, and this one is so forth. Okay? So that marginal part is uh, all done, and uh, the non-marginal part we look at a little bit already. Linear and nonlinear can use uh, partial correlation and the conditional independence and so forth. Okay. So uh, that's where we are. Are we done with uh, the graphing models? <laughs> there are still a lot of other things, right? Uh, because uh, here, you know, we've been a little bit ambiguous already in terms of uh, the nonlinear, which uh, already causes uh, you know, uh, introduction of uh, more complex models. And also the computability is uh, another issue. And also the building strategy is a little bit, basically you need to test uh, all pairwise relationships with or without a context. And if you have a big graphical model, a big domain with many random variables, 
That means what? It means, uh, you know, uh, a square, num uh, n square number of uh, such pairs that you need to determine. And also a uh, power set of uh, dependent context, right? You can depend on one, two, anywhere from uh, n minus two. Right? So that's a pretty, pretty big kind of set that you need to compute the, the condition. So there are a lot of, lot of tests for you to build a graphic model from ground up. Yeah? So even for the transformation, you also need to do that at square root number of dependencies because you need to check all the pairs. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's what I meant. Yeah. And, uh, is there any way to speed up the <laughs> Yeah, that, that's the whole point. You, you, you want to avoid doing that uh, at all because uh, once you are checking pairs, you just cannot just check this pair, but not that pair. Then there are n squared number of pairs, right? Do you know what I mean? Right, so you need to basically define a score of uh, x and y, or let's uh, call it uh, x1 and uh, x, uh, uh, xi and xj. Then i and j are both in the space of what? Of this whole set of graph, a lot. So this first principle approach is very sound, but it is uh, not very op 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 operationalizable. That's what I'm trying to say, okay? And that's why we still want to have a whole semester worth of graphical models, right? The simplest way, of course, is that people just forget about uh, all this calculation. Let's draw a graph and call it a graphic model and define things on top of it. And then go reverse and say, oh, this graphic model is consistent with a certain set of conditional independences. That's one way people do it, okay? That's about, it's more about the design first graphic model. And then nowadays, people even forget about conditional independences. For example, in your deep neural network, you draw arbitrary graphs, you know, whenever you see a dependency or whenever you feel like there needs to be a uh, a, a dependency or coupling, you just draw an edge. At that time, do you even worry about the independencies or whatever? You, you, you probably don't, right? Yeah, so okay, you see that the whole field evolves a lot, whether it is carrying a uh, principled statistical meaning, or it is just uh, for you to track knowledge, or maybe it becomes uh, just a vehicle for you to deploy an algorithm. We will actually unroll all these stories to at least let you know what you are actually doing. Maybe you thought you are tracking statistics, but I will tell you maybe you are after all just uh, playing an oracle and uh, carry out a algorithmic operation without convergence. That's actually a very important insight because sometimes people are trying in vain improving the so-called statistical properties of certain operation, but if the model wasn't started that way, you better drop that part and focus more on the implementation. Right. Okay, anyway, that gets you to the plan of the future lectures. I want to give you a very uh, quick update. So on lecture two, we are going to now study conditional independence graph more, in demand, more independently and more globally, going beyond pairwise test. Okay. This type of graphic model has many names, Markov networks, for example, and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, Markov random fields, and direct graphic models, and so forth, and that's kind of a, a a picture of what they, what they look like. And we're going to dive into the statistical meaning of that, and the, when you get a correct estimate, and when do you not, and so forth. And by the way, these type of models are very useful, very, very uh, you know, uh, generic. And people use it for all, over the, all sorts of purposes. And here are just one of my favorite uh, applications. Okay, in early days, you know, people model the game of uh, Go, for example, and uh, each uh, spot has uh, a white or a black uh, in a configuration, and uh, they are dependent uh, locally, and uh, therefore I can put a graphic model, literally copy this into that, and call these random variables, and call these dependencies. Okay, this model is known as the Ising model. Who is Ising, do you know? It's named after a particular guy. He was a physicist. Uh, did he win a Nobel Prize? I forgot, but at least that piece of work won a Nobel Prize. That model was used in the 50s to 
compute to model the atomic states of a solid, or solid states or atomic states of a, a piece of material, and was actually playing a pivotal role in calculating, you know, uh, nuclear energy, uh, atomic bomb, you know, uh, exploding conditions and so forth. People actually designed a model for you know computing those uh, very very important numbers. And if you replace all these uh, points with uh, pixels, then becomes the image model, okay, and uh, and so forth. So it's a very very interesting model. We are going to run through a few examples, hopefully inspiring you for projects. Lecture three will be uh, going toward uh, directed graph model. In here, you can see. Oh, by the way, so far we've been talking about you know. Uh, Mutual, mutual information, Pearson correlation, does not offer you directionality, right? It's symmetric. And, uh, but uh, the earlier motivating example uh, in biology I used clearly you know, uh, shows a value of uh, directionless, right? Something cost what? And uh, that defines a different type of graphic model known as the Bayesian networks or directed graphic models. So we're going to use a lecture to uh, to study that, and in fact, one of the key, uh, you know, maybe a representational convenience or computational convenience out of uh, Bayesian network, in addition to the interability, the causal interability, is that uh, the directed graph model allows a very important uh, property known as the factorization. You can now break the bigger joint distribution over all the random variables on the graph into a product of many, many little building blocks, which are either marginal distribution of the roots or the conditional distributions of intermediate and the leaf nodes. Okay? And we will see why this is important and why this allows a lot of a composability, comp compositionality nowadays people talking about in machine learning. And again, you know, these type of models are obviously very useful to model real world. You know, I, I bet you saw these kind of graphs. People used to use uh, genealogy to define relationships between people, and that easily leads to a graphical model in a direct sense where every individual has uh, two copies of uh, your DNA, right, from your father and mother, and then it defines yours, and then that gets, gets one of them or a combination of them gets passed to the descendant, and then, you know, trigger, you know, these uh, whole generations of, uh, of uh, genealogies. And uh, you can use you know, uh, this graph as a uh, guidance to write down a uh, fancy joint distribution. And then you can do a lot of things. Nowadays, people are tracing their ancestries to famous guys or to tell a family story. And that's actually you know, where you know, the, the technique foundation was actually from here. One of my students actually joined a company called uh, uh, Human Longevity, or, or maybe uh, I forgot which actually are doing this kind of business, quite fancy. And after that, we are going to use a, a good number of lectures uh, tentatively to dive deep into uh, inference and learning on graphic models. You know, here are some typical inference problems where you can con compute arbitrary conditional probability of random variables given others. And, uh, and uh, maybe what's the most uh, uh, likely configurations of uh, a subset of states, and how to draw samples from uh, marginals and conditionals. Drawing samples these days become very fancy. For example, we know the deep fake type of uh, uh, you know, applications, right? And that's because uh, they come up with a way to draw random samples from uh, image generation models or text generation models, right? So what's the statistical foundation of that? Right? So these topics are uh, non-existent 10 years ago, but uh, this course has been evolving continuously. So this semester, we're going to, in fact, put these materials into this foundation so that you can see the unified picture. And then how to learn these models is also a very good problem, right? In the past, learning has been very, very uh, uh, narrowly defined on learning from data in the, in the rigorous supervised learning sense with labels and uh, data points. But uh, as you can see, with you know, the newer graphical model framework that we're going to present, you can learn under a lot of rich background knowledges, such as rules, such as uh, uh, rewards, incentives, or maybe uh, co-learn with uh, a competing model to uh, compare the 
comparative advantage, which is the core idea behind the generative adversary models and all that. Right? So these can be all studied under the same umbrella. And uh, we are going to also uh, use uh, the later part of the lecture to study a few modern graphical models. The modern graphic model has been so interesting and so general such that uh, they start to become a uh, unifying umbrella of many you know, modern techniques, including, say, uh, reinforcement learning, deep learning, transfer learning, Bayesian nonparametrics. Uh, at the end of the day, I hope that you don't walk away with uh, a thousand different equations uh, or pointers to those equations, but uh, a few master equations that you can plug in different uh, building blocks you know, uh, for your specific applications, and then you can go from there to hopefully uh, get your work uh, you know, started, if not finished, in a shorter amount of time. Right? So that's the purpose of this, this course. And as I mentioned, as a new e experiment this year, uh, again, you know, we only have about 28 slots you know, for the whole semester. Uh, if, we add, if you want to have class in spring break, we have two more, but still, it's not enough. This field has been so big. Uh, so I want to experiment with this idea. Instead of I pick all the topics and cover all of that, I want to save, uh, say, uh, you know, 10 to 20 percent of the lecturing time for you guys to, uh, to, to order from a menu your favorite dish. Okay? And we are going to have votes. And uh, those topics that you feel strongly about uh, and, uh, to, to, to have a deep dive, we are going to dive into it. Or you can also order for topics which are survey, like everything. That's also fine. Because in the past, there has been complaints in opposite directions. Some people want to go deeper into the foundation. Some people feel, oh, this is not relevant to my daily uh, applications. Or maybe what I learned didn't get me a paper, and so on and so forth. Make, you, you can feel free to uh, put all your uh, you know, uh, desires into this wish list. And then we're going to poll you okay? and get the last uh, two or three lectures determined. How that sounds? Or do you want me to just pick for you? I assume the former. OK, deal. Great. So now to close, uh, so maybe to get back to the, the, the grounding story uh, question, what, what is graphic models? Right? I think here is something I want to remember. Graphic model is the name of a field or a, f a name of a way of thinking, not a name of the model. Okay, in the, in the, down the road you will be reviewers, right? In the past, you know, we've reviewed papers which opens like this. We solve problem X, Y, Z using graphic models. So that kind of uh, statement uh, you should, uh, you know, uh, take uh, not so seriously. It's almost like I want to solve a problem using mathematics. It's like saying nothing. Okay. So the, the graphic model is really providing you a language for communicating you know, your domain knowledge, designing the model, and also it gives you a language to arrange and plan and implement the computation, and now of course give you a language to develop further models. By itself, it is not a model. Okay? And also this is not anything new. In fact, this uh, uh, using the graph you know, to uh, uh, structurally design statistical models you know, goes a long way, you know, went a long way, you know, starting from uh, the 20s. But uh, Speaker Harter and Lorenzo was uh, the, the, the pair of uh, great statisticians who played maybe the most instrumental role in the uh, 1980s in uh, getting the, uh, the formulations more explicit. And of course, Judea Per, you know, who is a Nobel, uh, Turing Award winner, you know, because of his work in causality, also played a pivotal role you know, in getting the foundation correct. So that's where we are right now. Okay, so uh, just to uh, wrap up, if we have a graphic model, there are a lot of advantage. First is uh, this uh, representational advantage where you can, using a very local list, but more than pairwise, this is local list, but more than pairwise construction to build a global model. You end up saving a lot of parameters because now representing each of these building blocks using 
you know, conditional or marginal probabilities will be more economical than writing down the big you know, table and filling in all the numbers of uh, probabilities of configurations. And also, because of this uh, factorization rule, you can now find an easier way to do combinations of uh, modules of models. For example, that model, what if uh, this uh, cellular you know, uh, study, biological study, was carried out by two labs? Say this green part was uh, carried out by a laboratory in CMU, and the other one is uh, carried by a collaborating laboratory, or maybe non-collaborating laboratory you know, in PIT. And then you have two papers publishing different results only as uh, a fraction. You actually could use the graphic model for them to multiply them together and build a joint model for that very, very easily. And down the road, we are going to study also Bayesian inferences. In a sense, under the graphic model language, Bayesian inferences become an instance of graphic model. Okay? It's about uh, introducing prior knowledges and uh, defining prior distributions which really translates to just adding more nodes and edges into an existing graphic model. So the boundary between Bayesian and non-Bayesian, in here at least, is uh, not very explicit. Computationally, there's no difference. Philosophically, there are some debates, but uh, uh, I think uh, these days such debates are, uh, are dominated by the value you know, of the outcome rather than the philosophical foundations. Okay. And here are some uh, higher level uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, catches of uh, what a graphic model can offer you and how you take it to your work. And these are quotes I, I got from uh, Michael Jordan, who also played an instrumental role you know, in uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, advocating, educating graphic models. Um, so I hope you know, down the road you will find uh, the course material enjoyable. We have another 10 minutes. Uh, I have uh, a few other materials which were in the earlier day lectures, but now I downgrade them to uh, appendix uh, because they are kind of uh, tedious. But I can still go through that because we have another five minutes. How about we just uh, see a few graphical models? that uh, may be uh, useful for your downstream applications. Yeah. So in a nutshell, PGM you know, is multiverse statistic plus structure. Okay. In fact, not, there has been a trend, I wouldn't say a trend, maybe at least a way of thinking, where you even want to remove P. You can just call them GM, because uh, not all graphic models have to be probabilistic. Right? Any examples from you guys? There are plenty, by the way. You can easily name it, I believe. Yeah. Uh, it does not have to be probabilistic, but it's meant to be probabilistic if you want to do inference, right? Well, anyway, uh, you can choose it not to be probabilistic, but uh, uh, the incarnation of that genealogy right now in the literature is probabilistic. Okay. But there are something that is indeed not probabilistic and uh, in active use nowadays. You, I bet you know it. It's just like you're just one inch from that. Yeah. Like even that network, that's also not probabilistic. What's that? Networks. Generic networks. networks. Mm -hmm. OK. I, I can take that. If you don't want to be probabilistic, you can write a network like that. Hey, come on. What about deep learning? The whole thing about convolution neural network, right? And uh, the RNNs, are they probabilistic? Right. So there are a lot of graphic models out there which has uh, very little to do with probability. Although I'm going to show you down the road that they rooted from a probabilistic model and gets carried away by approximation, and at the end of the day, uh, we forget about approximation and the, get the model itself to be the, 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 the vehicle for computational inference. Right. So, yeah, so I, I prefer maybe to just call it graphical models to 
be more inviting, at least to people who do not practice probability, but you know, purely are mission driven. I think this is a fine view for that. But still, it means a multivariate, uh, maybe statistics is not the right thing, but multivariate uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, data domain plus structure. And uh, yeah, okay, I, I do have a material. So this is basically that non-probabilistic thing. It's a multivariate objective function. At least you need to have that, okay, to guide the model training plus structure. Uh, okay, let's see. Uh, let's see a few key models. <coughs> People starting uh, their basic... Uh, you know, uh, entrance into machine learning and statistics, probably, you know, know what is a density estimation, right? It's just, uh, you know, estimating key parameters of a univariate random variable in many cases, and Gaussian or multinomial. Well, even though it is a, a single random variable, you still can take that as a graphic model with one node, right? And, uh, if, uh, and then if you want to be Bayesian, then you can elevate the parameters, say the mean and the variance of uh, that Gaussian distribution to be also itself a random variable, that's a typical Bayesian view, then you already have a two-node graphical model, right? And the regression, that's very obvious. You are having, you know, a input. You are going to have uh, a uh, uh, continuous output in the case of a linear regression or a discrete output in terms of a logistic regression, and that's a two-node graphic model. And uh, classification, yeah, so that's uh, basically you know, uh, a logistic regression model. Mixture model, like a clustering, then you can have basically a uh, class label and uh, the data, and uh, depending on which way you connect, it could be you know, supervised or unsupervised classification. So these are simple graphic models. But uh, if I do classification multiple times, for example, or maybe clustering model times. This is uh, my observation of X. I want to cluster them. For example, I have uh, the audio signal from three individuals, okay? And uh, here I introduce uh, a latent variable which uh, indicates the label of that uh, you know, audio signal. Then this is obviously a clustering problem, right? You can use a k-means. You can use an EM algorithm to do that. But uh, the audio signal goes you know, uh, in time. Maybe 10 minutes later, you heard another burst of audio signal, right? You can, of course, uh, do another classroom problem, which are totally, you know, separate from the first one. But the uh, modern approach likes to connect them together because, uh, you know, uh, time continuity seems to suggest that the people don't move much. You know, if they are all you know, from the same location making phone call, chances for them to go to different cities in 10 minutes and making phone call from three sources are very unlikely. Therefore, the labels tend to continue. If the source comes from label one, then with high probability, that source will continue for the second time point. So how to capture that? Well, there is a dependency between that wise, right? And then you can go on and on like this. And many people saw this model before. What, what is this model? This is a graphical model, one of the most uh, typical celebrated graphical models called the HMM, Hidden Markov Models. Right? So that's basically you know, uh, where you found the, the graphic model to be very, very interesting and unifying. Because uh, you know, this is a graph from my friend Zubin. You know, he produced this graph of graphic models. You can see all the then famous, by the way, he drew this graph about 10 years ago. Okay. This uh, then graphical models can all be connected you know, as a, 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 almost like a plug and play assemblage exercise from building blocks, starting from a mixture of Gaussian, uh, just a Gaussian, and then mixture of Gaussian for clustering, and then HMM for sequential clustering, and uh, uh, dynamic systems, linear dynamic systems for common filters, for you know, prediction and the filtering, and the switching between multiple things so that you have a different dynamics and so forth. So it's very, very systematic you know, in understanding uh, machine learning models then. But even now, of course, this graph is maybe 10 times bigger already. You want to add uh, VAEs and GAN models and RL models and transfer learning models and so forth. But 
chances are we can still use uh, some master equations to describe that. So that's what we're hoping to achieve by the end of the semester. So this class is not like many other classes taught here and there where dive into one particular technique. It is uh, meant to be a uh, unifying class that tie together you know, techniques from all over the place. And hopefully you can use technique you learn from class A to solve problems appeared in class B because of this uh, umbrella you know, uh, you know, mechanisms that we're going to learn. And uh, again, here are some other fancy graph models you know, in reinforcement learning. You, know, you can you know, explicitly define actions, states, environments, and uh, outcomes, rewards in a sequential fashion. And these kind of models are the backbone now for autonomous vehicle driving and so forth. Machine translation is another big application where you know, the good old topic models that has been famous for a while in the field were used to do contextual sensitive translation that you are translating not just by aligning two sentences from different languages, but also to make their beyond just verbally aligned, but also semantically aligned. And how to do that? Well, it is because uh, you have some semantic underpinnings which are driving you know, uh, the contents from uh, a topic perspective. But again, we are going to dive into the technical part later in terms of how to achieve that. You saw this already from uh, genealogy, and you saw this easy model for physics and for games as well. Okay, so uh, we may be able to touch upon a few applications uh, even in this lecture, but uh, talking about your projects, I encourage you to uh, really let your interest and passion drive you to get some applications from these uh, domains you know, and form your team, collect your data, and uh, use some of the models we taught in the class or from literature. Okay, I think uh, we're about to wrap up. Any questions? Regarding logistics and the technical contents. Great. Then I will see you on Wednesday.